Speaker, it's a great honour to rise in this House and speak on the issues that are of concern to the people of Timmins James Bay, and I'm particularly interested in speaking on this Bill C-27. Mr. Speaker, I represent uh, communities across the vast region of northern uh, Ontario, and many of my communities are ground zero for the dysfunction in the relationship between the federal government and First Nations. Kishetchewan First Nation, where we had two mass evacuations in one uh, with win one year. At Awapiskat, the, the the, not only the nation was shocked, but the world was shocked by the horrific conditions in Attawapiskat last year. Attawapiskat as well, where children in fight to get a basic grade school had to take their fight all the way to the United Nations. So we're talking about a very broken relationship, Mr. Speaker. And we talk about accountability. Accountability is a fundamental of reestablishing that relationship. I think, Mr. Speaker, from my work within First Nations and from as a member of Parliament, that if the government was serious about addressing the fundamental dysfunction, they would start to shine the light of accountability within the Department of Indian Affairs, first and foremost. Uh, I have seen a black hole of accountability in that department, and I, I, it, it shocks me The government after government continues on with the same broken old colonial system. Mr. Speaker, getting basic numbers from Indian Affairs is an issue. So they talk about bans posting numbers. Well, we're talking about budgets of hundreds of millions of dollars that have no, uh, no accountability mechanisms to the people that should be receiving that accountability, which are the communities. For example, um, I was trying to find out why we had such a, a lack of construction for schools. Mr. Speaker, I was a school board trustee, Northeast Catholic School Board, a little rural school board, 15-some schools spread over 400 kilometers. You know, being a rural school board trustee, it has the same principles if you're a trustee in a city like Toronto or Vancouver. You have to follow these rules. And these rules are written, literally, uh, they are the law of the land. Because as when a child walks into a, a school, they have a set of rights. that They don't even know what those rights are, but those rights are guaranteed in law. The guarantee of a class size ratio. Um, the actual size of the classroom is written, written into law. How much funding per pupil? How much funding will be set aside for teacher salaries? Those are all written in the laws of each of the provinces. And the funding was hidden within ring fencing. Ring fencing is a, f a fundamental principle in terms of accountability. For example, it would be impossible for the community of London, Ontario to call its school board and say, guess what, you're not getting a school. We're going to take that because we've got to give actually higher salaries to some of our staff, or you're not going to get that uh, school because we're going to fix some roads this year. That would be illegal. But that happens in, in the world of Indian Affairs all the time. The basic principle of ring fencing doesn't exist in Indian Affairs because they don't want it to, to exist. So what does that mean? Well, between 1999 and 2007, $579 million was taken out of the capital facilities and maintenance program at Indian Affairs. $579 million that would have been spent on schools, that would have been spent on water treatment plants, that would have been spent on housing. So it was roughly $72 million a year that was pilfered from these communities. And where was it spent? Well, an order paper question explains to us they spent it on management, on legal, litigation, public affairs, communication. So while our kids were going to school on the largest contaminated toxic brownfield in North America and being exposed to levels of benzenes that cause um, liver cancers and skin cancers and bone cancers, they were taking this money and blowing it on spin doctors and lawyers. That is their lack of accountability. And until that changes, Mr. Speaker, nothing is going to really begin to move forward in these communities. They talk about Canadians having a right to information while they're saying to the parliamentary budget officer, take us to court if you want to know how we're spending money. Well, it was a parliamentary budget officer who had to shine a light on this government's absolute failure to protect the rights of children. Let's go back to this issue of child rights. Every child in this country has a set of rights unless they live on reserve. Then they get whatever Indian Affairs gives them. So the parliamentary budget officer looked at the situation of education on reserves. It was appalling what they found. They found that their quotes were, their management of school assets is, quote, erratic, haphazard, and without any coherent capital methodology whatsoever. So what does that mean? It means that in half of the provinces where the federal government has jurisdiction, they don't even monitor the capital assets. They don't even know if the schools are open. They don't know if they're full of mold. 
They don't know if they're shut. That they had taken over $122 million out of school construction and spent it elsewhere. That of the half of the existing schools, they said were in good condition, but they couldn't really tell because they hadn't investigated any of them. 77 schools listed as temporary structures. What the heck is a temporary structure? Is that a tent? Mr. Speaker, Canada is a signatory to international treaties on the rights of the child. Young Shannon Kustashin from Attawapiskat challenged this government. She said, how is it that because my skin is brown and I live in Attawapiskat First Nation that I'm denied rights that a child in Timmins or a child in Toronto takes for granted? That the right to an education is not just the right to a school, which the children in Attawapiskat were not being given, but the right to an education, and I can tell you this from a school board perspective, the right to an education is a plan for education. You have to have that plan, you have to have that methodology, but as a parliamentary budget officer showed, year after year, this government completely failed. And it wasn't just this government, this has been a long-standing failure to address basic issues. So, Mr. Speaker, in my community in Martin Falls, we're now seven years into a boiled water advisory. Seven years in a first world nation. Now, this is a community that happens to be sitting right beside the Ring of Fire. And every time I see government, I see Dalton McGuinty in Ontario. The Ring of Fire is going to save Ontario. They just can't wait to get their money on those resources. I hear that from the federal government. Meanwhile, the people are sitting beside the Ring of Fire. Seven years. They have to boil their water. And the government has just announced they're going to cut off bo bottled water to the community because it's too expensive. That is a lack of accountability. Mr. Speaker, this past summer in Attawapiskat, we had a plan to build 30 permanent houses that would have gone a long way to alleviating the uh, crisis in housing that still exists within that community. We had an agreement signed with Canada Housing and Mortgage Corporation, and Canada Housing and Mortgage doesn't sign agreements unless you actually have the financial wherewithal to pull this off. It was going to be a rent-to-own plan. This would have been a good news story, a really good news story. The government could have said, you know what, we sat down, this is what, this is what our base, the taxpayers want to hear, is that we have a rent-to-own plan, these people are building their houses. No, the Indian Affairs Minister scuttled that deal. He scuttled it to punish the community because they made them look bad. Now, under this bill, the minister gets to decide whether or not they're going to withhold funds to a band that he decides he doesn't like. Well, let's talk about what that was like in Attawapiskat last January. When that minister cut off education dollars to children, he used children and one of my communities as hostages to try and force a ban council to their knees over the third party manager. Now the third party manager finally we went to federal court and the federal court just came out with a decision that this government's position was indefensible and that they had no basis for the accusations they made against the community. But throughout that, for three months, Last January, February, March, they cut off the funding to the children. That would be illegal anywhere else. You couldn't do that in the provincial system. If you were fighting with the town, here we go. The Honourable Secretary is rising on a point of order. I'm doing my best, Mr. Speaker. On a point of order, this member is to say he's diverging from the topic we're debating is an understatement. I would ask him to refocus his comments on the actual bill and its contents as they were laid out by his own colleague in motions one, two, and three that we heard the speaker announce and asked us to speak to today. This is, it is a point of order. The, uh, the, uh, as, as is the practice in this house, members are given significant latitude when debating a motion uh, before this place. And I would uh, ask the honor this honorable member, as all honorable members, to uh, speak to the matter at hand and to address uh, what is before the House? The Honourable Member Timmins, James Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not asking for much latitude at all. I'm speaking right on this the bill. The failure of this the government now is they believe there's a quick, easy way to force through their agenda. And that's not how change happens. What we're seeing in terms of accountability, what I asked for in, this, in my speech, was I'd like to see accountability of the Department of Indian Affairs. Because that has stopped so much development basic issues where we have agreements in place where we can move forward and it sits on somebody's desk and then at the 11th hour it gets cancelled. That wouldn't happen at the provincial level. That would never happen. It happens at Indian Affairs all the time. So if we dealt with that, we would start to move ahead. Now in terms of accountability, I think the issue of accountability and financial accountability is paramount. So I'm certainly thinking, let's, let's work with this. 
But now we're seeing agreements that are being signed with uh, mining companies. I'd like to see uh, transparent agreements. I'd like to see transparent resource revenue sharing as our communities are developing so everybody knows. If you're moving into a territory, this, these, are the, these are the ground rules. This is what the companies have been asking for. They're saying, we know there's going to be rules. Show us what the rules are and then let us do it together. But what this government's doing is they're picking one group, the First Nation communities, treating them as the bad guys that they have to be punished as opposed mm -hmm. to doing this in a coherent manner where we can actually move forward to withhold funding. Now, I know to their base that they play the dog whistle vote to all the time about those bad native people, that that sounds like a great thing. You're going to be able to punish those native communities. Well, they punished the children of Attawapiskat for three solid months by you cutting off funding to education. That would be illegal under the provincial system. That would be illegal. You could not do it. They did it, and they had to go to federal court, and they lost. So now they're having to change the law so that they can go impose those kind of punishments on communities, and they think they're going to get away with it. Mr. Speaker, you cannot hold children as hostages like this government did in Attawapiskat from January to March of 2012. Questions and comments?